every company in a Fallout game is a warning story about capitalism. I definitely want to start out this episode about Nuka-Cola. Everybody loves Nuka-Cola with kind of a meta commentary here. There's a reason we love Nuka-Cola. And it's marketing. Which is kind of interesting when you think about it, because we're not in the game. We are not the humans who live in the world of Fallout. We're not the ones experiencing the world before the bombs dropped. We're not the ones out in the wasteland years later looking at the corpse of a previous civilization and finding these new Coca-Cola advertisements and bottle caps and characters. We're the players of the game. We are one step removed. And yet it occurs to me that the marketing that would have been designed in the game for the game world people works on us as well. Okay. So what, what am I talking about here? And, and this comes from doing some research for this episode. And it's just kind of an idea that has dawned on me. When we think about the things that we love in Fallout, and this happens in many different ways, we think about the stuff that is fun and cute and kind of cool. You know, like the Vault Boy, which represents Vault Tech, or Nuka Cola, which represents the, I guess, marketing of a beverage that you can drink that's very similar to real world beverages that we like to drink and the characters and the fonts and the colors and and all of these things that are used in the marketing in the game and it works on us also even though we're one step removed and even though like i've discussed with vault tech they're a super shady company they are a corporation that was doing some really dark stuff and yet we still look at vault boy and we go oh look at vault boy he's cute and there's a part of us that realizes that like yeah this is ironic yeah these things were meant as marketing and they're, they're meant to kind of draw you in and make you feel safe about the product and the world but then there's a part of us that just kind of forgets that and just lets it go and goes yeah vault boy i'll get a tattoo with his face on it even though his face represents the taking away of people's rights and using them for scientific experimentation, right? Do you see where I'm going with this? Okay, so let's dig into Nuka-Cola here because Nuka-Cola, if vault kind of did that a little bit, Nuka-Cola is the company that leveraged marketing the best in the world of Fallout. Just take a look at the logo. You've got the font, you've got the bright red color, very similar to a very famous cola company, obviously. But we're combining that with Nuka Cola World and the uh, Nuka Girl. All of these images that come from so many other things. So Nuka World is very Disney World inspired. And the marketing that goes with that, the characters, the fun. And then you have Nuka Girl. And I think I'm going to do an entire episode next week on Nuka Girl. Because that marketing campaign is really interesting. And the way that it ties to real world characters. The sci-fi of the 1950s and 60s. So my point here is that when you take a look at all these things and you just kind of keep seeing them over and over and over in the games... You just kind of grow a fondness. Oh, it's Nuka Cola. Oh, there's a quantum over there. It glows without even thinking about the fact that it's irradiating our bodies from the inside. <laughs> so, here, let's get into some details here. Nuka Cola was a company that was founded in 2044. So, this is a good few decades before the bombs dropped in 2077. And it was founded by an individual, this, this man named John Caleb. Bradburton, which is a really interesting name, because when you dig into this, the name John Caleb Bradburton is a direct reference to both Coca-Cola's creator, John Pemberton, and Pepsi's creator, Caleb Bradham. 
So John Pember- Pemberton and Caleb Bradham, Bradham, Bradham becomes John Caleb Bradburton. See how they just kind of transposed both names into one name. So clearly this is a reference to both of the big soda companies that we have. And they're by and large, way larger than any other soft drink companies out there. And John Caleb Bradburton is a very interesting individual. He is a inventor, a chemist, and someone who founded this company with the dream of it becoming the largest soft drink company in the world, which it does. He founded the company in 2042, and it was in 2044 that Nuka-Cola was actually put out into the world. It took them two years. This uh, John Caleb and his beverageers which are what they were called. These were organic chemists that he worked with to come up with the concoction of Nuka-Cola two years. Now, beverage years, that might kind of ring something in your brain a little bit. At Disney World, and traditionally back in the 1960s and 70s, and I think still today, the people who work on coming up with concepts for the rides and ways to make the automatronics look more realistic and and that kind of thing are called imagineers so to me i I don't know if this is a hundred percent correct but this definitely seems like a pull from imagineers to beverage years the people who are coming up with these concepts again another place where we go okay this is not just a reference to you know coca-cola this is a reference to if coca-cola and disney were merged together right so Skipping ahead a little bit, we end up at 2049. This is five more years go by. And Pemberton was in a situation where he was at a fairgrounds and he was watching hundreds of people enjoying his new cola. And he's quoted as having said, a day like this should be every day. And then that was the founding of the concept of Nuka World. And for those of you who have played Fallout 4 and the Nuka World DLC. You've been in Nuka World. You know what the remnants of Nuka World look like years later, 200 years in the future. But that was the origin right there. This concept that like, hey, you know what? We've got a bunch of people at a fairgrounds drinking my soda. Why don't we just do this every day? So let's make a theme park. Now, theme parks take a while to build. If you've been keeping up with the news of theme parks around, say, Nintendo World or whatever that's called, Nintendo Land, or some of these other newer theme parks that have been designed in in the United States and even other places around the world, like the creation of Disney and other locations, it takes years. You're basically building a little city with lots of rides and lots of infrastructure in order to not only have people walking around a park going on rides and things, but the food, the security everything else. You're designing a small community that you're going to let people in every morning and then you're going to let them all out by the evening and then clean it all up for the next day. Like this takes a lot of work. Well, it's pretty amazing here because Nuka World, because of the success of Nuka Cola and all of the money and I guess leverage they had at the time, were able to launch this within one year. Nuka World launched on May 1st, so happy happy May the 4th, it's when I'm recording this, but this is the beginning of May, May 1st, 2050. So we're now, what, 28 years away from the launching of Nuka World? And the opening of Nuka World began with Nuka Town, USA, you know the different locations in Nuka World, and Kitty Kingdom. Those were the first two locations that came online at Nuka World. Now, the grand opening happens and 40,000 people spill into the park. This is, again, reminiscent of the launching of Disney World back in the 1960s. And it was a huge success. Everybody loved Nuka World. Now, it took another eight years for them to include the expansion Dry Rock Gulch. And then another nine years after that, so from 2058 to 2067, for the Safari Adventure to be launched. And again, references to Disney World, Disney's Animal Kingdom, definitely a connection here. And then eventually, the the Galactic Zone, which I think is my favorite part of the park, (laughs) in, in 2072. And that's when you have the entire park as we know it in the game 
coming online. Now, it, it, when you think about that, that's a long time, but it actually matches kind of the way that theme parks develop in the real world, right? Now, with the expansion of these different zones, the total number of people that could be fit into the park doubled. Around 80,000 people at a time could fit into Nuka World. And when you think about that, that is just a huge statistic. Think about when you go to a stadium and you watch a football game or a baseball game. A big stadium holds 30, 40,000 people. That's double that all in one location. And they were keeping the park full. Everybody loved Nuka Cola. And why is that? Well, I have a feeling it has to do with the marketing. Now, with the launching of Nuka Cola World, Nuka World, we have the creation of two characters, Bottle and Cappy. And Bottle and Cappy were not used in the primary marketing of Nuka Cola. What you see in the primary marketing is Nuka Girl. You see her picture, you see her kind of lounging back with her her blaster and Bottle and Cappy were not part of that. They, they were part of the main park and they were designed as characters to use as part of the theme for the park. And you might think, well, these are kind of like cartoon characters, kind of like Mickey Mouse. And in a lot of the um, the marketing that went out has both Bottle and Cappy talking. I'm going to play some of this at the end. Stay till the end. I'm going to put the actual audio from that whole thing at the end of the show. Um, but you have this like kind of rubber hose animation, black and white quality stuff going on from very reminiscent of early Disney kinds of cartoons in some of the marketing for Bottle and Cappy. But most of that was designed around safety info for people at the park, which by <laughs> by the way, was only at the minimum required standard for getting 80,000 people into this theme park. So Bottle and Cappy show up and they are there to guide visitors in the park, to try to keep them safe, to keep them entertained. You even have different locations in the park that are designed around Bottle and Cappy, including their tree house. You can go visit their tree house. And they became a very popular addition to the Nuka Cola branding. But most of their branding was focused on Nuka Girl. And I'm, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm going to talk about more of that on the next episode. Now, for the rest of this episode, I want to focus on Mr. Bradburton because his story is the Nuka Cola story. What happens next in the timeline is probably the part that most of us miss. Now, you might realize what I'm about to share. If you spent time in Nuka World, in the actual DLC expansion, going through the terminals and reading through everything, and then, of course, you get to meet uh, Mr. Brad Burton's head, which is, of course, tied into this as well. But if you don't know all of the details around this, or maybe even if you notice some of this as you went through the game, there's, there's probably a little bit more for you to uh, discover here. We're going to talk about the Leap X Project, and Brad Burton's connection to the military? Yeah, warning story here. I told you guys, warning story about capitalism, corporations. All right, we'll be right back. If you have any questions about Nuka World, I'd be delighted to answer them. All right, so let's talk about the Leap X program. So the Leap X program is basically a governmental program that was designed to preserve biological tissue and keep individuals alive indefinitely. Sounds like something Mr. House might have been interested in, right? Well, in order to do that, they needed a, a whole host of biomechanical engineers, the kinds of people who understand chemistry. And the original concept here was to design a living bio suit that preserved the entire body. But the, the program only got so far before the great war happened. And they did have some, some success because they reached out to John Caleb Bradburton 
and said, hey, buddy, we know you've got a bunch of these biochemists over there. Why don't we get together? We could use your help and let's work on this LeapX program. And so they did. And they had a minimal amount of success. In fact, they had about 15 pounds of success because that's the amount of organic matter that they were able to preserve using this new technology. Now, how much does a human head weigh, right? Less than 15 pounds, which means that you have the ability using this technology to preserve somebody's head in a jar, kind of like Futurama. Now, all of this was done secretly. Originally, when the when uh, Bradberton took on this program, he started putting his engineers to work on this. And the only other person who knew that this was actually going on was his executive assistant, Peyton Huxley. She was the only one. And as the development this, of this continued, Bradberton became more and more interested in the concept of what this could actually mean for himself. Now, pause. Let's pause here. Think about our real world situation. Think about the mega rich. And I'm talking the Jeff Bezos or the Elon Musks of this world. They can have anything they want. They have billions of dollars. And when people talk about these numbers, it's hard to imagine the distance between what an average, let's say an average American makes somewhere between what, 30 and 60 grand a year, 30 and $60,000 a year. Let's just average that out somewhere in the middle around $50,000. Somebody who is well-employed has been working at their job for a while. Let's just say $50,000 a year. If you work for 40 years, 40 years of your life, and you save every penny of that, you will have earned $2 million in your lifetime. $2 million in your lifetime, your entire lifetime. And you compare that to somebody like Brad Burton here, or one of our real world individuals who would have earned billions of dollars, billions so a billion dollars is a thousand times more than a million dollars. Think about that. Somebody who, who has hundreds of billions of dollars, that is a hundred thousand times more than a million dollars. Does this kind of put it to scale here? So if you're the kind of individual that has the amount of income equivalent to an entire city of other people <laughs> or more then you can have anything you want. And this has psychological ramifications. They've done studies on this. The more individuals make above the average income, the less empathetic they are towards others. This is sci scientific truth. This is, these are studies that they do and the information comes back again and again and again. When people make more money, they relate less to others. They care less about other people. And they know that they need to do some marketing in order to make people realize that like, oh, they're not terrible rich people who are just, you know, stepping on poorer people or the average person. And so they donate to charities and things like that. And they're, you know, it, to their credit, I'm sure that some of them genuinely care about charities and, and doing good in the world and those kinds of things. But let's let's just take a moment here and think about it. If you really wanted to, you know, end world hunger or help with the medical needs of people or homelessness or any anything that would help large groups of people actually live better lives, get back on their feet, and you have hundreds of billions of dollars, then why are we going to space? And I love space, but just let's just put that out in the world and just say, do you think maybe... If individuals, and this is my point, who are that wealthy, understood and related to others, that they'd be focusing a little bit more on it, right? It's very rare that you get somebody who has devoted the majority of their income and are at that scale to helping other people. It does happen. There are those people out there, but they're in the minority. So anyway, let's just move on. So Bradburton is clearly this kind of individual, right? And as the war gets closer, he decides, you know what? 
I'm going to try to preserve my own existence, which of course is the one thing that when you have everything in the world that you might lack is your ability to keep living. And so he takes his head and preserves it in a little jar and in the game you can meet him. You can go visit Bradburton. Now there's a dilemma here. Imagine you are reduced to simply your head in a jar. You have no body, you have no agency, your head is in a jar and the machine is keeping you alive. Your head is functional. It probably falls asleep, probably wakes up again. And all you have is you and your thoughts for 200 years in a jar and you can't die. You can't stop living. Can you imagine what that would do to you? Human beings who are put in isolation chambers in days have traumatic psychological ramifications. They deal with all sorts of stuff. You put somebody in an isolation chamber for weeks or months by themselves. And I'm not even talking like in the dark, like a sensory deprivation kind of situation just by themselves with nothing to do but their own thoughts. And in this situation, their bodies as well. Bradburton is a head in a jar. And he exists for hundreds of years. And you get to meet him. And we don't know a ton about him otherwise, but we do know some information about what he was doing from his terminals. And the... His concerns aren't necessarily, like I noted before, the most ethical. So, for example, during the development of the different Nuka-Cola flavors, there was a lot of experimenting going on. There was chemistry and and these other things. Nuka-Cola Quantum, as many of you know, has twice the calories, maybe twice the flavor, but is also radioactive. And in testing for this, they used human subjects and not all of the human subjects survived and there's a uh, terminal entry here from Bradburton to Peyton Huxley who's again the, the assistant the only one who knew what was going on the only one who actually knew that he put his head in a vat by the way um, and this this just gives you some insight into Bradburton's personality it says here Absolutely loved the Nuka condolences, and that's in quotes, fruit and cheese baskets you sent out to the families of our early prototype quantum flavor testers. Great idea. I think I loved the fine prints of the health damage waiver you had them sign before they joined up even more. Saved us billions, I suspect. You're at the top of your game, Peyton, and maybe someday you'll be sitting in the big chair. For now... Enjoy that shiny new no, <laughs> new quantum blue Corvega you found parked in your driveway this morning. You earned it. He saved billions of dollars because something Peyton did. Gave her a car. Which, by the way, doesn't cost billions of dollars. And is really, really into this idea that, well, you know, we're going to send our condolences to the families of the people who died in the testing by giving them fruit and cheese baskets because that'll work. You get the whole, like not really empathizing with people thing. That is, that's an example right there. So, so there's not a whole lot else to say about him as an individual other than obviously he's the kind of person that we would come to expect in these kinds of situations. Um, but to, to kind of end this episode, I want to, go over some of the uh, acquisitions of new flavors. If you recall, in Nuka World, you have all of these different flavors of Nuka-Cola that you can try out. And we actually have in the text in the game, in, in one of the documents, you can find where they got the flavor ideas from, who they stole them from, and some notes about them. So check this out. So these are acquisitions. First on the list, Merle's Very Cherry Soda, original name, Merle's Very Cherry Soda, previous patent holder, Merle Haverston, new name, Nuka Cherry, 
and it's noted as having been launched. It was put into the world, right? Flavor profile, new Coca-Cola and cherry mixture. Notes, original formula was a local home-brewed pure cherry soft drink, made slight adjustments to formula, but otherwise left flavor intact. Mixed with Nuka Cola, then enhanced with color to boost visual appeal because marketing. So they took this person's patent and reworked it into their own thing. Now, did they buy that from them? Did they do something else in order to achieve this? Well, I'm not sure exactly. Next on the list, Grape Pearl Soda was the original name. Previous patent holder, Joni Chang. New name, Nuka Grape. And it's been launched as well at the time of this writing. Flavor profile, grape. <laughs> just grape. The, the cherry one was Nuka-Cola and cherry mixture. This one's just grape. <laughs> There's no Nuka-Cola flavor in the flavor profile. Notes, original formula sold overseas. Flavor profile, virtually unchanged. Slight ingredient adjustments for cost purposes. Corporations, yay. Full rebranding and repackaging completed as per Nuka-Cola marketing division. So they basically took the flavor, reduced the cost of making it, kept the flavor the same, and just repackaged it, put it out into the world. This happens all the time, by the way. We've got another one here. Sharon's Down Home Country Lemon. That's the original name. Previous patent holder, Sharon Lawrence. New name, Nuka-Cola Clear. And this one was awaiting final approval at the writing of this. Flavor profile, lemon lime. Notes, original formula holds promise, but ingredients are quite expensive. Don't recommend use of current formula for cost-effective production. We'll try and work out the kinks to get the flavor ready as soon as possible. So this one wasn't ready yet. It was too expensive to make. And so they were trying to find ways of reducing the cost, which makes sense. You got to keep it affordable but what exactly is too expensive you know was there i mean this is something that everybody should be aware of the actual cost of making a soft drink the amount like so let's say you go to a uh, a fast food restaurant or wherever and you buy a large soft drink the cup costs more than the soda that was put in the cup let that sink in you buy a large soft drink, that paper cup with a plastic lid and a straw costs more to make than the actual drink that goes inside it. And we're paying dollars for this. So for a company like Nuka-Cola, the amount of profit for cost is extreme. The idea that like, oh, well, this one's a little too expensive. What's that mean? Like, even if it was triple the cost of the other ones, they'd still be making so much money off of it. And yet they've got to squeeze out every penny. Yay. Capitalism. All right. So <laughs> man, this is, everyone's going to be like, wow, Tom hates capitalism. I don't hate capitalism. Capitalism needs to be balanced with the needs of other people. That's everything needs to be balanced. No one ideology is safe on an island by itself because it becomes extreme and no longer cares about the people who help design it because that's the way ideologies work. Anyway, the last one here on the list is packed full of Joe and Joe meaning like a cup of Joe, like coffee. That's the original name. Previous patent holder is William Lee. New name, Nuka Boost. This was an experimental flavor. The flavor profile is Nuka Cola and coffee mixture. Now imagine a cola flavor and coffee mixed together. I can't imagine that this tastes good. And the notes confirm it because it says original formula adjusted to mix with Nuka Cola flavor profile. Initial taste test, not positive. Recommend we rethink this flavor combination. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can't imagine a coffee flavored cola combination being good, but I don't know, maybe I'm not the biggest coffee fan, so maybe somebody out there would like something like that. I'm thinking more of like a tiramisu, tiramisu. I don't know how to pronounce words. Um, that might be better, but that's what we got for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you don't leave this thinking, wow, Tom hates capitalism. Uh, no, just, you know, just moderation in all things, right? So 
Thanks for tuning in. That's what I got. That's what we got going on. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Stay safe out there. I'll see you next time. Rabbit Fair was a place with all the zip of Nuka Cola. Welcome to Nuka World, America's favorite vacation destination. I'm Cappy. <laughs> oh, and I'm Bottle. And we're here to make sure you have F-U-N fun during your time at the park. The mechanical issues of the past have been resolved, so now it's up to you to stay safe by following these simple rules. a nice view. Are you certain we're allowed to be here, Cappy? Ah, uh, don't worry, Bottle. Yeah! <laughs> uh, I don't feel so good, Cappy. I think I gotta get out. All righty. <laughs> Acceptable safety standard met When sugar's for adventure Ooh. And Ooh. 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 Ooh.